I carved out the words insane. I started hearing voices. I never felt I was one stable person. Now they're going to get me. He said just that's a friend. I started losing a lot of hope. And then I was taken to the hospital by the police. I almost lost trust you. The psychotic is She's weird. She doesn't work. She's a boss. But I told that I was court ordered to take the injection. I'm participating in this documentary because I, like millions of people, suffered for most of my adult life from symptoms that are called manic depression. And having spent over 20 years in and out of conventional Western psychiatrist's office being given almost every pill I think that they have in their arsenal and discovering that none of them really work, certainly not in the long term. So I went on and off the drugs for years and had episodes and depressions and manic episodes and finally after a, a last spectacular manic episode had really had enough and um, did a great deal of homework in uh, trying to find alternate ways to balance out my system naturally rather than throwing synthetic drugs on top of symptoms of an unbalanced system. And it's working. It's been over two years a long slow process of learning new things just about every two weeks or month touch wood somewhere no symptoms no ups no downs which is in my life nothing short of a miracle doctors who believe what they're saying saying you can't get well and you'll never be better makes it so much worse because you're already in a terrible state and, yeah. the, and the number I mean every shrink I've been to has said oh you won't get better the guy at the hospital going, you'll be back you'll be back <coughs> and you'll be having shock treatment next time and I just <coughs> sit there I, and they've been watching these poor old ladies go down and come back to the oh. and I just thought oh god I know never. and, like and what, so they know? don't say there's hope they in fact eliminate hope. I think they install fear My second year I uh, was in residence and uh, I started getting more and more depressed and uh, suffered a lot from high anxiety and I started getting paranoid I thought uh, you know every time people I didn't know students I didn't know were walking by me I'd hear the snatches of conversation by the, uh, from them saying oh isn't he this or that um, demeaning remarks and of course they were saying nothing of the kind they were just discussing their own business I would try to go into class and I would be so terrified that I uh, put my back towards the door and back in and sit down in the front row and just put my uh, hands in front of my face and uh, again a classic attention grabber you know which is exactly what I was trying to avoid one of the things I did then, which a lot of people who come down with schizophrenia do, is I would walk aimlessly, miles and miles and miles, going nowhere in particular, um, just preoccupied with my own thoughts. I started hearing voices a little bit, just a couple times. I heard voices like, uh, I thought I was in a room full of people in my living room, and my mom and my brother were there, and a bunch of other people, and I thought they were saying bad things about me, like, oh, look at her, she's so-and-so, and, and uh, so I confronted my mom afterwards, and, you know, said, why were you guys saying those things about me? And uh, she said they weren't, so I ended up getting in a fight with uh, my mom and, and her boyfriend, and, uh, and then I was taken to the hospital by the police. I... I got a, my compass and my eraser at school and I carved out the words insane and I used to color it with my pen and stamp it all over my <laughs> books and it was sort of like a premonition about what was to come. So uh, I had a, a really bad break and then I got into drugs. Mm -hmm. I did everything, stopped short of taking heroin. I did everything else, a lot of LSD. Yeah, me too. Yeah, <laughs> just like trying to escape from this whole thing that was happening to me. Bob, you got a wild story. 
I had my first episode of depression 30 years ago when I was 17, but I didn't know what it was. I just was in a blue mood all the time. I was irritable. There were angry outbursts for no particular reason. But then there'd be episodes of flaring up of energy, sort of hypomanic sort of states. I was reactive, intense, very intense over nothing obvious, hypersensitive to the slightest criticism, mm -hmm. however well intended. I just seemed to ruminate about it and magnify it. And then there would be odd surges of creativity and energy, which could go high or low. So I, I never felt I was one stable person. One of the things we have to separate here is the difference between perceptual disorders and mood disorders. So if, for example, you're seeing things and hearing things and um, uh, you have strange sensations in your body and so on, this is a perceptual problem. Mm -hmm. That's very different to feeling depressed or feeling elated, which is an emotional or a mood problem. Uh, so a lot of people with manic depression actually have perceptual problems and we think the label is probably wrong. I thought I was telepathic. I thought everybody in the world had read my mind and that they had a negative impression of me. So when I thought that I had caused people uh, in different provinces commit suicide because of uh, me blasting them with waves of telepathic neurotic hatred. I, um, I thought, well, you know, now they're going to get me. My parents uh, met me at the airport. They saw me from 20 yards away and I was just, ah, and they, the first thing they thought was, uh-oh, uh, uh, chemicals, right, hallucinogenics. That's what my sisters thought too, and my brother, that I was taking a lot of LST every single day because I was in that state every single day. Our theory, which I think is correct, is that there's an abnormal production of one or more hallucinogens in the body, and we think they are derived from adrenaline. And, and we're looking upon an or adrenochrome and adrenochrome and adrenalutein as potential candidates for this villain that acts on the brain as if they had taken LSD. It's as if I were to, if I were to give you LSD once a day without you knowing it, you would then become psychotic, but you wouldn't know why. And so we think this is what happens in the body, that the, you know, their own body produces these hallucinogens and this is what makes them psychotic. It all seemed very confusing. I read book after book. And some of the books said that you could add thyroid medication to antidepressants. So I tried that. That didn't seem to do anything. Then another book said you could add lithium. So the doctors, the psychiatrist said, yes, well, you can add lithium. So I did that. That stabilized me into a seething melancholy. So, but, but at least I was stable. Okay? Just, uh, I was, I was flat. I, I was flat. One of my clients, who's a therapist, said, you know, you need to go to a psychiatrist and get a proper diagnosis. And he referred me to one, and the chap was very kind, and he actually gave me some psychological tests, and he said, you have dysthymia. And I was so happy because finally I had a name to put to all these problems. But I didn't realize that dysthymia just means chronic depression. So it was an absolutely useless label, okay? But then I'd been told I was depressed, or that I had double depression, or that I had dysthymia, so I had this comforting collection of labels, but not getting any better. Well, did you real, ever read the DSM, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual? It's how they diagnose, and there's mm -hmm. a list of, I think it's no. seven characteristics, and if you have four of them or something, I'm getting the numbers wrong, yeah. you get the label on the top of the page, and it gets really crazy. <laughs> years ago when it came to my office and she was really angry very intelligent young woman very angry and she said she'd uh, she'd become psychotic and she became fearful she began to smash up all her furniture she was afraid she might even do more so she <coughs> fled and lived on the streets for two weeks and she found herself in the local psychiatric hospital and after being there a couple of days the psychiatrist came along and spent 10 minutes where he said you don't have schizophrenia you have borderline personality disorder we can't treat borderline personality disorder, you're out. 
until she came. So this intelligent young woman read the APA diagnostic manual. She read up thoroughly on the borderline personality disorder, and she read about schizophrenia, and she said to me, I am schizophrenic, I am not borderline disorder. What is it, that state that it, seems it, to have so many names? <laughs> uh, basically, it's a disorder of brain metabolism. Mm -hmm. It can be caused by an enormous variety of problems. To develop a schizophrenic picture, we do have what we call schizoaffective, where you can't make up your mind, is it manic depressive or is it schizophrenia? So we call it schizoaffective. We're not sure. Have you ever yeah. heard of Dr. Bradford Weeks, who was speaking at this conference two weeks ago on orthomolecular yeah. nutrition? He's and he was wonderful. He was yeah. talking about learning to see your thoughts as uh, temporary things that aren't you. As opposed to saying, I'm paranoid, you go, I'm having a paranoid thought. Now, the nature of thought is that it changes, so I'll just watch it and wait till it goes away. Uh, one of the things I like to do is ask them, what do they think is going on? And they'll, of course, say, I don't know. And I'll say, well, what do you think is going on? They'll say, well, you're the doctor. And I'll say, well, what do you think is going on? And they'll say, well, and they'll actually describe very clearly what their situation is. But the whole uh, medical system and psychiatric system is not designed to really listen to the patients, not designed to listen with the patients. It's really designed to diagnose, treat. And unfortunately, this whole issue of stigma, it's just to get them out of sight. And Ian and his best friend Chris were saying, were talking about their past hospitalizations and their their psychotic breakdowns and schizophrenia. I, I, of course, for all year, the, my years in Montreal that I lived there, my father was an old-fashioned guy. Now, shh, you know, she's fine. Oh, she's a bit weird. She doesn't work. She's a bum, you know. Oh, you know, quiet. Shh, you know, she's just a bit strange. And so um, I, I got to, I was sitting in this pub, and I say, Ian, please, there's people. The waitresses are going to hear us. And what are people going to think? And, you know. But then I started meeting, I started meeting all, everybody seems to have schizophrenia. <laughs> when I was hospitalized, I saw a psychiatrist who was on top of all the latest research. He said, yes, it's uh, the psychosis, it's biochemical. It was caused by nonspecific stresses, you know, emotional trauma. And basically what he was hinting at was that it was my parents's. Mm -hmm. fault. My, parents. my parents, you know, thought about it for a couple of months and they decided no way. It's exquisitely painful for a mother or a father to accept that they have a mentally defective child. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They may want to help, but they don't understand. And they have a whole lot of fear. Fear, yeah. And what do they do? I think a lot of parents just feel their child is bad. He's being really bad. On purpose. To, on, on purpose. purpose. purpose yeah. I, I can actually say something about parents. I mean, I, I've spoken to a lot of parents who have gone the traditional route with their children because they're intimidated. And I think it, it takes a lot of courage to actually take a child. It, it was courage for me to actually look for another method uh, because I was given such flack by the traditional um, medical oh, profession. No psychiatrist, no reputed psychiatrist in 1998 would say schizophrenia or manic depression or severe clinical depression is not biochemical. They're not doing enough to uh, tell each and every parent who walks through their doors, hey, it's not your fault. your fault, it's not your kid's fault, it's not society's fault. When the bed came free, uh, my parents talked to me and uh, for some reason I was in a quiet mood and I agreed to go. And uh, then the radio was on I heard Barbara from, from As It Happens, saying, what a docile little boy, what an image of a baby, you know, he's agreeing to be shoved into hospital against his will. I think when you're incarcerated against your will, which is not a pleasant thing to be, a lot of the people don't want the drugs down this road, but you, of course, have to have them. They find legal ways to make sure you take them. So when I was talking, I was talking about being in a state of delusion and how real that is, and that perhaps the worst approach is the approach used in American hospitals, which is, I'm paraphrasing here, basically, you've got to know you're crazy, and you are crazy, and we're going to feed you these drugs until you do and not let you out until you realize you're crazy. Well, if you're in a paranoid, delusional state, that's about the worst thing you can say. So I said something like, one must have compassion for the delusion and acknowledge that the patient thinks it's real. Of course. Well, 
about three psychiatrists came up afterwards and went, that's an interesting <laughs> idea. And I thought, my God, what are they taught in school? The traditional treatment is drugs. And here I'm talking primarily about a class of drugs called tranquilizers. And they have been changing with time. They started off with simple phenothiazines, and now they're much more complicated. We also use uh, the classical treatment also includes uh, uh, antidepressants. And in a small number of cases, it may include anticonvulsants, but primarily it's drug-oriented therapy. And these drugs are very helpful. I, I certainly would have difficulty practicing without them. But in my experience, going back now to, uh, to 1955, schizophrenic patients on drugs alone don't get well. It's very rare. Even the strongest proponent of drug therapy will maintain that less than 10% of their people ever go back to work. It's a very expensive disease that destroys humanity, destroys people. It's a kind of living death because it strikes so early. It'll strike a young man who is 25 at the prime of his life and he's finished. That is if he is only given drugs. The drugs were uh, worked. They worked, but they also made me very lethargic, very tired, very... The side effects were were uncountable. I felt horrible. I couldn't see uh, straight. My eyes were blurry. I had um, dys artist dyskinesia, which mm -hmm. was shaking, shaking. I started losing a lot of hope. You know, I thought, well, the only way I can ever feel um, different than having this dragged out blah feeling is to have the hallucinations come back. You know, I almost wanted to uh, be psychotic again. I was so angry, I got on the phone to the drug company and a very kind pharmacologist whose job it was to field these calls, he listened to me. I was just hot. I was hostile. And I poured out all the adverse effects. I was having trouble sleeping. I was just angry and agitated. I was anxious. I was just dripping with sweat. There was a whole list of effects. And he said very calmly, yes, we know our drug does that. I said, well, what do you mean, you know, your drug makes sick people worse? He says, now hold on here. It doesn't make all sick people worse. And we're, you know, I'm sorry to hear you're one of these ones where it's not really helping you. Please go back to your doctor. He'll reduce the dose. But of course, on the lower dose, the depression broke through. We have miracle medicines. They work extremely well in certain situations. So we use them in everything because we think that everything is going to be just as miraculous. And what we're seeing now is the damaging effects of those drugs. Uh, there are 106,000, in one estimate from a study, 106,000 deaths every year from the side effects of drugs. That's more than twice as many from car accidents in the United States. So prescription drugs kill more people in car accidents. It's amazing. And that's when they're used correctly. And, but then I'd go back and say, well, I'm having this problem, that problem. He'd say, don't worry, you'll get better. We'll double your dose. So I thought, well, he's a healthcare professional. He had many degrees and diplomas on his wall. I'll trust him. So we'd double the dose. Well, of course, I'd get worse and worse. He kept doubling the dose. So finally, I, was, I figured I was going to lose everything. My home, my family, my business. And I, but I kept reading. The doctor said, don't read, don't learn about your illness, just trust me, take the pills. But I figured, you know, screw it, I'm going to read. I think there's frustration among patients, but there's also frustration among doctors. Doctors also don't know what to do for some of these things, and sometimes, unfortunately, they design their treatments out of frustration rather than knowledge. You know, it's like, well, I gave him that because there's nothing else to do, or I gave her that treatment because there's nothing else to do. You see that with chemotherapy for cancer, they give a treatment because there's nothing else. They don't know what else to do. In fact, I have a lot of other things that I could offer them, nutrition and vitamins and alternative treatments to the conventional medicine. But sometimes even I don't have anything and I don't want to give people treatment that may be dangerous just because I don't know what to do. How do you get patients, all of you, off the medications, particularly the benzodiazepines, which I gather actually grow new neural receptors if you've had them for any length of time? It's very, Is very hard very difficult. You have to be very vigorous with therapy if you can get them off with high doses, I think, that, that help of vitamin C, niacin, vitamin B6, magnesium in particular, and other things that help anxiety. If they can get out and exercise, it really relieves a lot. So I think that's putting a combination program together is more important than any one thing that you consider like a magic bullet. Many of the psychiatrists I addressed in at that convention thing in Nebraska who didn't expect what I was going to say, and I've learned so much more now that I would have had, were coming up and asking me questions 
which sort of shocked me. Like, how did you find out that uh, Depakote tries to mimic the effects of GABA and cerebral spinal fluid? And I had to go, it's written on the package. <laughs> I would read one page and I kept reading the same page over and over and nothing would sink in and I so at that point I thought well you know I'm just unmotivated I'm a, you know I'm just a lazy there's something wrong with me I should go for a run and then maybe I could memorize my page better and then I just started getting more and more depressed so I started taking wake up pills because I thought well I'm, I don't have any energy so I need some caffeine so I started taking um, four wake up pills a day and each wake up pill is equal to 35 cups of coffee Woo! and I still couldn't get up I guess the caffeine finally hit me because I after I graduated I ran out into the field and I was running all over the place a week later I was in the hospital and they drugged me up totally so I was flat out for I don't I can't I have no recollection of the time with nutritional deficiency and a real blood sugar problem it's very very easy to go into mental illness so what we tend to see is people are, are malnourished they start using stimulants mm -hmm. because they use stimulants they can't sleep at night so they start having alcohol because they have alcohol they get depressed because they're depressed they get put on on some medication to bring them up because of that they get more anxious because of that you know something to bring them down and uh, before long you got a mental health problem you're diagnosed with schizophrenia if you were to come to me with the symptoms of schizophrenia or the symptoms of bipolar psychosis or anxiety it doesn't matter what it is first question I have is why do you have food allergies food allergies so they they are really cerebral allergies who are masquerading as if they were schizophrenic or manic depressed allergies B3 dependency B3 deficiency pyridoxine dependency zinc deficiency excess copper there are a whole variety of things that will mimic what we see as the final syndromes and i noticed this when he was in the hospital before long before i became a nutritionist and i'd say hey you know his stomach is all upset here. He's having digestive problems and, and he's got sore throats all the time. And like there's something going on here. It seems to be connected with his mental state. I've seen a large number of schizophrenic patients who were cured, cured when they stopped drinking milk. Most people don't look upon milk as a hallucinogen, but if you are allergic to it, and many people, you get a kind of a brain allergy, which makes you psychotic. So food allergies are a major part of it milk, wheat, uh, eggs, things like that. I stopped talking to people for days. I was on kind of a high. Uh, I, I, I felt totally euphoric and I thought uh, people were crying tears of joy every time they saw me because I was uh, and the things I imagined they were saying about me was look at him you know he's 21 and he's got the maturity of 70 years of age <laughs> tears of joy running down faces. So when someone's having these hallucinations and hearing voices which f most people will you know send them crazy in the sense that you get pretty paranoid if that's happening what's actually happening is the normal chemicals in their brain mm -hmm. we call them the neurotransmitters they they kind of the communication molecules adrenaline uh, is one dopamine is another uh, they, they get processed wrongly and actually they break down into substances that are hallucinogens well, I've had people come to me for example with panic attacks and panic attacks you think oh my god they're gonna have to be on a uh, medication or heavy-duty psychotherapy in fact uh, on occasion I've diagnosed them as hypoglycemic and once they went on an appropriate hypoglycemia diet and kept their blood sugar more balanced and some other supplements such as chromium vanadium magnesium manganese and vitamin C and so on once they began to balance themselves biochemically this so-called psychological problem the panic attacks seemed to go away all of our function, kind of our brain mm -hmm. and everything depends on a, a stable level of glucose in the blood. And uh, the conventional view used to be that you're either fine or you have diabetes. 
But now we know there's a big gray area in the middle um, where someone has a blood sugar problem. And of course, if your blood sugar shoots too high, you can become very manic. Mm -hmm. And if it shoots too low, you can become very depressed. So very often mood swings are connected with an inability to keep blood sugar levels even. Listen, I just heard a lecture at the last orthomolecular conference on fats, which I never would have listened to before. And I was sitting with my girlfriend, and it was clear we were the only two sort of perennial patients in the room. It was mostly doctors. And at one point, as this fellow was talking about oils and the symptoms, the mental symptoms you can get without the essential oils, essential my girlfriend Rosie went, essential oils, of course, they're essential. If you're deprived of either one of the two essential fatty acids, your behavior changes because your brain doesn't work, because your brain is made out of food, and if the foods you require for the structure of the brain aren't there, it doesn't make sense that you would expect the brain to function normally. There are studies that show that schizophrenics hallucinate less when they get the essential fatty acids to require. There are studies that show that your intelligence goes up and you learn faster. Learning disabilities, uh, clumsiness, or what's called dyspraxia, respond well to essential fatty acids and they have to get from foods two substances the body can't make. Some 70 percent of our brain is made directly out of fat. And the big problem these days is that we're eating the wrong kind of fat. We eat a lot of saturated fat from, from milk products or from meat. And also a lot of the fats we eat have been damaged or processed. You see, if you look on a lot of products, you see these hydrogenated vegetable oils, and they're mm. really bad news. What we're lacking are essential fats, and they come from seeds and nuts, and also from fish, particularly the fish with teeth. There's kind of a, a, a framework in which these episodes happen. I was tending to be variable, volatile, vulnerable to deep, dark, long depressions for no reason. But then there'd be episodes of flaring up of energy, sort of hypomanic sort of states. This is what we call high histamine. And what histamine does is it speeds up the body's metabolism. It like turns up the fire. And they tend to be compulsive and obsessive in their personality. They wake up early. Their mind is always thinking. And this is not a problem. There's an awful lot of very successful people mm -hmm. uh, and creative people and multimillionaires and so on who are high histamine. They're kind of driven people. However, the high histamine people tend to become deficient in nutrients because they burn up the nutrients faster. So if they're on a bad diet, that sort of mild, compulsive, obsessive tendency can really flip over into mental illness. Uh, downside of this type of personality which is they go into a state of suicidal depression have you done your analysis in toxic minerals yes i have you had low zinc high copper yeah which I is very high copper, yeah, yeah. well that's in the, in the in i had high zinc and, and copper smoking oh. believe me smoking is uh, it will increase and the uranium uranium, uranium. yeah and and Dr. Oh. Hopper last night said that's from the mountains i live near montana oh. There's quite a few heavy metals or toxic metals that affect brain function. Uh, lead used to be the most concerning, but now probably we're looking more at copper. See, copper, unlike lead, is essential for the body. You need a small amount, about one or two milligrams. But some people get much too much copper. And I'll give you a lovely example. And what does copper do? The same well, as lead? Well, copper makes you very anxious. So we need a certain amount of zinc and a certain amount of copper. And if you're zinc deficient and you're getting too much copper, this can actually flip you over the edge as well. A mental health center where I was consulting, we had a young lady who had been in the hospital for three months and was on sufficient psychotropic medication that she could not attend high school. And she was one of those people who had uh, white spots in her fingernails uh, and uh, painful knee joints, things like that. So I just started her on zinc and B6 and over a couple of weeks she was able to get off her medications. and. Uh, was doing quite well but as uh, we've learned over the years of course no one really believes that anything could be that simple 
we have a very good concept of nutrients, you know, vitamins, minerals, essential fats, and so on. But what's really changed in our modern life is our intake of anti-nutrients, mm -hmm. substances that may be toxic you know, to the body. Well, it could be anything from <coughs> pollution, you know, in terms of, of car exhaust. It could be pesticides, which create a problem for some people. It could be uh, food chemicals. We have three and a half thousand permitted man-made chemicals now in our food supply. Mm. And we, we consume on average 16 pounds a year. Half of the stuff that when I started to go that made me even crazier was being frightened of being crazy. And that stress the way of understanding stress is it's, it's the body's way of going into fifth gear and it's an emergency mode and it's something we're not meant to be in all the time and you can know this because one of the major effects of adrenaline is to shut down digestion, shut down repair and channel everything towards energy and if you run out of nutrients and you have this excess adrenaline you may start making substances like adrenochrome uh, which can make you even more you know, crazy. That's exactly what happens. Any, anything that will increase the secretion of adrenaline, which includes stress, it includes reactions to foods. In fact, one of the body's ways of dealing with a violent allergic reaction is to dump a lot of adrenaline to the body. If you go to the emergency because you're having a severe reaction, they shoot you with adrenaline. And uh, if you have the potential to become schizophrenic, that is, you have the potential to make adrenochrome in excess quantities, then it will increase under these effects of this kind of stress. So allergies will do it, stress will do it. Severe unremitting stress can be very, very harmful to patients with schizophrenia. A doctor um, uh, whom my parents had met uh, said, uh, I know another doctor and her son uh, had these kind of problems and uh, Apparently the solution was quite simple. He was treated nutritionally. I started taking the uh, niacinamide and the vitamin C in mega doses, three grams a day each. And uh, within a month, I was starting to be like my old self. Mm. And within two months, I was quite a lot better. And I'd started taking the vitamins before I actually seen Dr. Hoffer. And when I saw him, he said the improvement would continue, and it did. The molecular is very simple, although it sounds complex. It just means correcting the molecular balance in the body. We're all made up of molecules. If we're made up of the correct ones, if we eat the correct ones or take in the correct ones, we have a much better chance of being healthy or recovering from illness than if we take in the wrong ones. So orthomolecular medicine is basically the use of natural substances that occur in the body, and that uh, includes diet and it includes supplements to the diet. It might include uh, vitamins, minerals, amino acids, fatty acids, the essential nutrients that we have. Six months after taking the vitamins, I was reading the newspaper saying, what can I do? There was a job offered to teach skiing and I had been on the racing team at university. I phoned them up and I told them my background. They hired me and I taught skiing that winter and I wasn't on any medication whatsoever, just the mega vitamin therapy of uh, Dr. Carl Pfeiffer. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I went and walked into Dr. Hoffer and he gave me the uh, HOD test, the Hoffer Osmond Diagnostic mm -hmm. Test. He said, you're schizophrenic. Mm -hmm. And it just floored me. I thought, what? Oh, I, there's a name for it, you know? And he said, yeah, and I want to put you on the B3, B6, zinc, and uh, vitamin C mega doses. So I did that and off sugar and mm -hmm. you know the whole nutrition it's hard thing to cut out, isn't it? yeah the sugar was hard <laughs> but uh, I, for three months I was religious I didn't even eat ketchup I didn't if I, anything had sugar in it I didn't touch it and uh, and I still thought well I'm not, I still don't feel any better and he said so I went back in to see Dr. Hoffer after about three months and he said well why don't you take the HOD test again and, and just See, so I took it, and there was a 30-point difference. Wow. I had, I had actually improved, but I wasn't feeling like mm -hmm. I was. So then later on, another three months went by, and then I got really sick. Mm -hmm. I think it was all the toxins coming out. Mm -hmm. And I just, I went into hospital for three months, mm -hmm. and uh, he upped my meds. I had some shock treatments, and that mm -hmm. seemed to do the trick.
Great, and then you're staying on the medication? I, I'm on low me meds. Mm -hmm. I've stayed on all, yeah. I've added vitamins of my own over the years. Great. Yeah. So the combination treatment is the best because with the combination treatment, once you have used the drug to help them improve, you maintain that improvement by the use of vitamins so you can now withdraw the drug, get rid of the drugs entirely, or, or take such a small amount that there are no side effects, and now they're able to function perfectly well. And when I tried to get them at the hospital to uh, give Darren the treatments that he suggested, B3 and C, and all those things, and uh, of course at the hospital I said, oh no, that's toxic, those vitamins are toxic. As if the pills are. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the pills are really good for you. Oh, yeah. Don't take those vitamins. Uh, my mom uh, brought the vitamins to the hospital and they, they actually blackmailed me to not to take my medication. So they would say, you don't get any more help if you don't take your medication. <laughs> That's probably so the blackmail. best thing that happened. Uh, well, yeah. it was the best thing that happened for the, for the yeah. opposite, for the yeah. flip reverse, because then what happened was I found out about vitamins and yeah. three weeks after taking B3 at, at a high dosage, the B3 being parent and being schizophrenic, um, started to clear my, my side effects, my symptoms, and they lowered the medication. With any treatment, including orthomolecular treatment, one has to take into account the potential side effects. And there are two types of side effects. There are the major or life-threatening side effects, and there are the minor inconveniences. For example, with niacin, there's a flush. When they first start taking it, they start flushing, which is hot, and they're red and itchy. And if they don't know what's going to happen, they get frightened. It's a minor inconvenience. It's not a major threat. By this point, I'd read about 150 books, and something was starting to sink in. And the books from Europe actually said that depression is being treated using ginkgo and other things like St. John's wort, and they work. And the beauty of why they work, they have minimal adverse effects. St. John's wort became very popular, and I had been using it already in my practice, and I really wanted to share the experience that I had had with it, because it's so important for the medical profession to know that there is a very, very good substitute. For you know, the synthetic antidepressants work okay, but they have really bad side effects, really bad, starting headache, insomnia, anxiety, sexual dysfunction. I mean, who wants those side effects? And the research has shown that when you take St. John's wort, you can have all the effects, the positive effects of an antidepressant, and you don't have these terrible side effects. So I gradually pieced together from reading a lot of the papers from the Journal of Orthomolecular Medicine, which vitamins, minerals, and amino acids work as teams and help the brain restore normal function. And then, of course, I read a lot of things about diet. So I didn't expect that would be a factor at all. But I started to change my diet. I cut out sugar. I cut out white flour, and I would say at the moment I'm 95% of normal, all through doing things that conventional doctors seem to scoff and laugh at. Do you have patients who have gotten better from what would be a classical Western diagnosis of, say, whether it be schizophrenia or manic depression, where conventionalism says the patient cannot get better? Oh, certainly, yeah. yeah. And I'm just one of the uh, newcomers, relatively speaking, over the last 10 years in this, you know. Hoffer's files are, uh, are tremendous. Mm -hmm. I remember a patient of mine who first came to me having been delusional, had hallucinations when she was in high school. She had been an honor student and all of a sudden her life was shattered. And I saw her nine years later. She had been through every drug in the book. She had been through alcoholism, uh, street drugs, trying to find something for herself to, and nothing seemed to work for her. And finally she came to me and I put her on a program of diet and vitamins and it was absolutely astonishing to me because I had a little skepticism myself back in those days. And within three to six weeks, she started to feel a little bit better, just a little bit, just beginning. And then within a few months, she was almost completely better. And she had been ill for nine years. When I deal with people's mood disorders and schizophrenia, I try and make a measure of what's happening with them. And then I investigate them exceedingly thoroughly because I find that the vast majority of people do have biochemical problems which we can define, correct, and then they get better, which is really rather nice. That doesn't mean I don't use the standard medications. Of course I do. They're, they're, uh, they're useful. But I, I don't pretend that they are the, the, the be-all and end-all that we're supposed to believe.
No, that's just a sort of little crutch while orthomolecular treatment is starting to work. If you had a house plant um, and it was kind of fading green, you would think, is there too much light? Is there too little water? You would, you would look to see if there's toxicities involved or deficiencies. And we all know that. Mm -hmm. And so why do, we, why do we lead with an expensive pharmaceutical agent when we wouldn't do that with our plant? We check to see the water and check to see what the light is. So uh, it's not really discovering orthomolecular work. It's really remembering that that's what we should be doing all along. You know, the statement is, if, if you eat a well-balanced diet, you get all the vitamins and minerals you need. And any intelligent person asks, well, what is a well-balanced diet? And the answer is, it's a diet that gives you all the vitamins and minerals you need, right? <laughs> so you kind of spin out of this um, cycle thinking, well, I probably eat a well-balanced diet. Well, and that is a myth. There's not a whole lot you need to know. There's only about 50 essential nutrients. All you want to do is put together a program that gives you optimum quantities, and you have to guess at them because they're somewhat different for people, of all 50. And you have to start taking those so you're getting at least the basic material and then see how many problems disappear. And then you maybe have, you maybe need to spend more time on certain people, like Dr. Hoffer talks about, the ones that require much higher doses for some reason that are dependent on certain nutrients or that need to be detoxified. So the approach is not that complicated. The unexpected effects with nutrients are generally benefits. So I talk about side benefits. So when you give a uh, nutrient, vitamin B complex, for example, for a mood disorder, which it may help in many cases, sometimes it's efficiency. If you do that, you're going to find that you lower their homocysteine levels in the blood. That's a metabolite that is associated with heart disease. So giving B vitamins for one purpose has a side benefit is it lowers heart disease. So I can tell my patients, if they ask me, and I often tell, I say to them, why don't you ask me how dangerous this is? They say, okay, how dangerous is it? And I'll say, well, you're going to live longer. Is that going to be a problem for you? Most people don't find that a problem. I think cure, uh, in terms of any illness, is not really the right term. I think the propensity will always be there. But when we treat appropriately, when we restore the balance, then, then you have a healing. But cure means that the propensity may be gone, and I don't think so. If we have a propensity, it'll stay there. And that it would be a false, um, it would be an illusion to tell people, you're cured, that's it. Because in fact, they do have to maintain a certain diet and certain supplements in order to maintain that balance. I was interviewed uh, once or twice uh, uh, for a television program or for a newspaper and I remember one time watching myself on the tube they had spliced out the part where I talked about vitamins yeah. wow. <laughs> oh really I went to three different doctors right. can you give me a referral to see Dr. Hover oh you don't want to go see him you can join my my group therapy session or you can no that guy's a quack or all those vitamins uh, that's just a, a bunch of crap and you don't want to believe that Many of my colleagues have been at great risk and many have lost their licenses for practicing what I think is absolutely appropriate medicine and far more appropriate than uh, what's called conventional medicine. Uh, so uh, anyway, I got this registered letter that said uh, within 10 days they no longer wanted me to prescribe vitamins, minerals, or make dietary adjustments in my hospitalized patients. And uh, I called around like uh, Carl Pfeiffer, uh, and uh, several others. I had, I think, 11 people lined up to come in and testify on my behalf if something was going to happen at the hospital. And then I called an attorney whose daughter had, uh, he was a very prominent attorney in Kansas, whose daughter had had an acute schizophrenic break and did very well, uh, and to this day is doing very well. Uh, anyway, I called him and asked if he would help, and he said, oh, sure. Uh, I think his direct quote was, I, I've always wanted to sue those bastards. And uh, he wrote a letter, the punchline of which uh, was, uh, the last paragraph was, that if the committee wanted to go to court and to maintain the standard of care in Wichita, Kansas, was to shock, sedate, and sedate, we would be happy to do so. And restrain, I think, was the shock, sedate, and restrain, I think, was the refrain. And then suddenly, within uh, uh, 
a week or so, it was fine for me to prescribe vitamins, minerals, and make dietary adjustments. One doctor at an interview I gave the other day, a lecture I gave, had a question from the audience afterwards. He said, what if a patient comes to me and wants to try a nutritional therapy? And my, I don't know much about it, except that it doesn't work. And I just want to know what advice I should give them. And I said, more important than the advice you give the patient is to listen to yourself. You're asking a question. I don't know much about it, except that it doesn't work. Well, if you don't know about it, how is it you have an opinion on it? Doctors are inherently um, very conservative. They're also um, very reluctant to overstep the bounds of what their teachers in medical school want them to believe. Uh, and there is a climate of fear and um, um, brainwashing that does occur. Uh, fortunately, that's all breaking down. And um, slowly and steadily, the tide is turning I I in the direction. And slowly and steadily, they are finding themselves dragged, kicking and screaming and whining and sniveling into um, um, making concessions to orthomolecular ideas here and there. And the pharmaceutical companies control medicine not in the sense that there's a plot, I don't think there's a plot, in the sense that they are selling a product, they're going to advertise their product. So the average doctor reads only about drugs. That's all they're taught.